Good morning, members. Um, thank you all very much for um, attending, and I want to thank the people that are uh, coming in by uh, Zoom. Um, first of all, I'm going to call on um, Mr. Kilfeather to read out the COVID uh, situation for today's meeting. Uh, Could members, the National Standard Operating Guidance for attendance of council meetings provide that all in attendance be informed at the start of the meetings of the COVID-19 control measures in place. I'd like to draw your attention to a few issues. Each person attending this meeting in person should have completed a COVID declaration form before entering the room. These forms will also serve as a record of attendance for contact tracing purposes, if so required. This meeting room has been prepared in accordance with the Standard Operating Guidance. Face coverings must be worn by all attendees when entering and leaving the room. There should be no congregation in the building before or after the meeting. A one-way system is in place for entering and exiting the room. Exit will be via the side door. In compliance with the recommendations in the standard operating guidance, the meeting will not exceed one hour and 55 minutes. Attendees must adhere at all times to the two metre physical distancing and follow the public health advice in relation to hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. A response plan is in place in the event that an attendee at the meeting feels unwell or is displaying possible COVID-19 symptoms. An isolation room has been provided. If anyone feels unwell during the meeting, you should alert myself or Kevin and you will be escorted to the isolation room. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Mr. Confeder. Um, at the outset, can I ask all the members please to mute your microphones and if you wish to speak, to turn your microphone on because the people virtually can't hear us. Um, the agenda isn't, isn't too long. There's 46, 45 items on it. We've no headed items, so with your cooperation, we'll get through the whole agenda today. Uh, can whoever is coming in virtually, can you mute your microphones, please? Thanks. Um, so we'll, we'll get the meeting underway. First item, item number one, to note minutes of the Sligo Local Traveller Accommodation Consultative meet, Meeting held in. Councillor Gino, yeah. Second. Can I get a second or whoever was at that meeting? Anyone else at that? Second. Oh, Councillor Baker. Yeah. Thank you. Item number two. Uh, the meetings of the Municipal District Ballymote to Bukhari, 21st. Proposed. Councillor Connolly and seconded by Councillor Milani. Thank you. Uh, to confirm minutes, uh, Councillor Walsh, Councillor O'Grady. Item number four, proposed Councillor O'Grady. Second. Sorry. Who seconded that one? Councillor Gilroy, thank you. Item number five. Councillor O'Boyle. Second. Thank you. Councillor Gibbons. Item number six. To approve to approve pursuant of section one eight two of the Local Government Act, the disposal of I propose, sure. Right. Uh, Councillor McSharry seconded and uh, Councillor O'Boyle second proposed. Thank you. Seven, contribution to the arts 2021. Councillor O'Grady seconded. Uh, Councillor Fox. Thank you. Item eight. Councillor O'Grady. Second. Councillor Walsh. Number nine, to appoint a member to fill the casual vacancy. Um, uh, on the joint Northwest Joint Homelessness Consultative Forum arising from the res resignation of Councillor Chris McManus. No, Councillor Grady proposed it and Number nine, this is the one we're on now, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, to appoint a member to, to fill the casual vacancy of the Joint Homelessness Consultative Forum proposed. Second, so the name of Councillor Arthur Gibbons will fill that position. Thank you, Councillor. Yes. Put on your mic. If you go back to number eight and see the bid report, and actually that the new bid is started, 
and it was felt because it was onshore or whatever else, add a new uh, member of this council to be nominated to Sligo Bait. It's actually on the report. Now, I have, I've been asked in relation to it, would I show, or was I still interested in it? So my name is up there for, if it is, but it is actually on the report, if you go through the report there. Am I right, Kevin? Yeah. Um, uh, John Riley, can you come in on that? Yeah, I can. Sorry, I, I'd been trying to put up my hand there, Kyra, just to say that they, um, I circulated the report. As you know, that the um, the votes were eighty of those who voted eighty percent in favour, twenty percent against. The um, the decisions sought are to approve implementation of the proposed bid scheme to be financed in whole or in part from bid contribution levies and to take effect directly and operate until the 31st of December 2025 and also to nominate a member to the bid board and in the second context, Councillor Gibbons is the current member on the bid board and has expressed a with an, an interest in continuing. Thank you, Kaherlik. Uh, thank you, John, for that. That's okay. That's agreed. So, oh yeah, I have proposer of uh, Councillor Thomas Healy. Are you uh, agreeing to? You you've uh, proposed and Councillor Grady seconded. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, item number ten to note the monthly manager noted. Okay. On to deferred motions. Councillor Bray, number eleven. Coherlock, Coherlock, I wish to defer that. Your Lovely. Th thanks, Councillor Bree. Um, item number 12, Councillor McGuire. And I want to thank all this. Sorry, I forgot to just say at the outset of all the motions. Um, thank Jimmy. He sent out all the replies on Friday. So everyone is happy enough with them. Um, Councillor McGuire, um, number 12. You're muted, Sinead, sorry. No, you're, you're, you're muted again. No, your microphone doesn't appear to be working, Sinead, sorry. We, we can't hear you, Sinead. Can we come back to you? Jimmy is going to text you. Is that okay? Hear me now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Grand. Grand. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for uh, deferring this motion. I was unable to attend the adjourned meeting of last month. Um, in the meantime, I've been furnished with the minutes of a meeting that was held in April of last year uh, in relation to the Surf Centre. I replaced um, Councillor McManus when he got elected uh, to the European Parliament as a member of the, of the Surf Centre. But I'm not sure that been uh, communicated with the board because I wasn't issued with an invitation to meeting and also I know from the that um, Councillor uh, McManus was excused his attendance because he was then an MEP. Um, so I want to possibly send a letter to the board again indicating it has been sustained member. And then further on that, I'm delighted um, with the report uh, at the report in the case of the domestic and um, this morning I hear that uh, an additional 350,000 under the RDF has been approved um, through Minister for Community uh, Development, Heather Humphreys, um, and that uh, this project initially received 615,000 under the Rural Regeneration and Development Fund. It was co-funded by Folger Ireland uh, to 142,000 and Sligo County Council uh, provided match funding under the RDF. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, there has been an increase in uh, building costs, um, which has delayed the progress. Um, so today's announcement by Minister Feehan and Minister Humphreys um, that the project uh, will now go ahead with the additional funding is to be very welcomed. I know um, many people in Strand Hill and further afield will be delighted to hear that news and to see this flag flagship project proceeding. Thank you, Kira. 
Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. I hear because the second of the motion and I do know that my colleague was involved in the Slago Surf School and I feel myself this a fantastic venture and I welcome any funding that has come there in relation to it. But I'd like to use this platform in relation to a scene that is actually here in front of us. It's the surfing that's going on at Strand Hill at the moment and in different places around Sligo. There was gatherings out there. Now, I'm not knocking the surf school. Surf school is like everybody else. The earth slowed down over the COVID-19. But you have surfers coming from all over Ireland into it. Ocean FM has only reported it there a few weeks ago and whatever else. I do know that the resources of Angarda Shikona is stretched to the limit. And I think everybody is, that's even any of the frontline workers in relation to this. But the plea that I am putting out there in relation to anybody that's abusing the whole thing of the COVID with the beach closed off and whatever else, and people coming down from Innescroen, as far as from Northern Ireland, over from Dublin and whatever else surfing, is they should desist until this pandemic is completely over. And I do feel that in relation to it, the whole vigours of the law should be thrown at them. Because people are out there and they are expected to stay within their own areas, within their five kilometres. A lot of these surfers that's going into these areas, the likes of Mullock, Moore, Strija, Strandhill, they're abusing that. And at the end of the day, I feel myself that the likes of those should be picked at a checkpoint. Their equipment should be taken off them. That is the reality to it. And it should be auctioned to pay for the resources that they're putting the guards through, that extra resources. But I do feel it's something that needs to be addressed. But as for the motion itself, I'm very happy to second the motion. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. Uh, Councillor Maguire, can I just ask you to come in? Had you a question there because your audio was breaking up? Sorry. Just um, at the start. Yeah. From the um, information I've received, Councillor uh, McManus still appears to have been the board member appointed, although he was uh, elected at that point. Uh, to as a member of the European Parliament um, and I was nominated to replace him on the board but I wasn't notified of the meeting um, and I was asking that the council would write again to the board and notify them of the change of nomination to the membership. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Moran? Yeah, certainly we'll arrange to issue a further letter. I, I, I do. I'm, my understanding is that the board were notified, but we will issue a further letter. Lovely. Thank you. Is, is that okay, Councillor McGuire? Thank you. Motion number 13, Councillor Fox and Councillor Walsh. Yeah. <clears throat> Just to. Um, can I ask for a copy of the application to be circulated, if it's possible? Uh, uh, and just to know, um, just briefly, that uh, I've been speaking to uh, various people in the community about this walk between uh, Half Moon Bay and Sligo Town, and uh, I spoke to the uh, owners of, of uh, Hillswood House as well. And um, look, at we, we, it'll be a great project if we could get it going. Um, it's, there's a lot to be um, to be um, achieved there. Um, there's a great example out in um, out just there at uh, St Angeles where uh, a walk has been um, established, and uh, it'd be a great example for this walk. Um, it's it's uh, it's an area that should be focused on. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Yeah, just to support the motion, uh, I know Councillor Fox has done a lot of work on this um, with the engineers, um, uh, and this has been submitted for funding. So all going well. Um, it'll be a new avenue. Um, a new recreational area that's much needed in this area um, and I support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. Go here, look. It's, it's not a new, um, how would you call it? It's not a new walk. It's restoring an old walk that used to be there. And that walk used to come in the whole way in as far as Ardone on the Mall. And the name of it from that section at Ardone out was Finton's Avenue. And I think in the other names that was on about there were sections of a court are called. But I often heard my parents on about it. There was a lovely walk. Lots of young couples used to go there summers even and whatever else for lovely walks around that area. And that was it. Probably that's 
How would you call that wee bit of magic that was there, kind of spark there, alive, or whatever. But I'm just saying, in relation to it, it would be something, and I've heard it mentioned over the years, and people looking to get it opened, it would be a fantastic asset to Sligo. And I think myself, Hazelwood, it's one of the most beautiful series. I think it's been one of the most used resources last year, I think, uh, out of all the resources we have around Sligo, and I think it can be expanded on if we bring it in there through our dawn and into Sligo. It's absolutely a fabulous walk, and I think myself, it should be time and effort, and Captain needs to go into it. Thanks very much. Lovely, thank you. Support the motion. Everybody supports the motion, thank you. Uh, motion number 14, Councillor Gilroy, second by Councillor Haley. Um, thanks very much for the reply. Um, it's a bit disappointing that there hasn't been any progress made on it since uh, since I first uh, put that in over a year ago. Um, there is an issue there, um, and I know we've been short of staff in the roads office, but now that a few staff are starting to be uh, freed up, I'd request that that it gets a priority because it is a safety issue in Ballasadere. Parents have approached me, the school management have approached me, and uh, I'd very much like to see it done. Uh, delighted to see that the sign will be put up, even if it's on a temporary basis. I do know that a bit of design and thinking needs to go into it, but I think if, if all parties sit around the table, we'll come up with a successful answer. Thank you. Councillor Haley. Well, if Councillor uh, Gilroy is disappointed, I'm surely disappointed because this is on the table since 2015. Uh, the council were asked to carry out a survey that time. They did carry out works where they did put in a painted pedestrian crossing. Uh, one thing I would say about Councillor Gilroy's motion as well, he has to include the residence committee of that estate because that is that that school is uh, is covered in by estates in Salamaris, uh, Woodbrook Heights, and that. And at that time in 2015, the board of management was meant to meet with the of the. The different groups around there were meant to meet with Sligo County Council on the roads department of it. That never happened. Uh, in relation to the sign uh, coming off the in the N59, I I welcome that sign, but we also need to make sure that there's a sign as well down at Wood, Woodbrook Heights, facing into the estate. Um, issues I raised here before as well is coming off the N59, turned into Salamaras, where there's a blind spot there. The road is very narrow. Uh, there's a lack of lighting there and everything else. There's a major issue there. It's been raised with the council on numerous occasions. There was a petition carried out with the residents in 2015 and again in 2019, and there was motions put down in 15, 19, 20, and also by Councillor Gilroy. So, as I says, this needs to be addressed. We did meet with the with the aerial engineer at one stage and the roads department. The roads department told me there that uh, we requested for a speed survey to be carried out. It never happened. Uh, back in 2009 and 16. There was works carried out on the main road coming into it. At that time, we requested that ramps would be put in, and also if ramps couldn't be put in, that the 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 white the they'd increase the narrow the road sides itself. So as well as that, if we're going to go and put in a pedestrian crossing, we also have to talk to the person who lives in one of the houses there where this pedestrian crossing will be going outside. It's I don't think it's just straightforward as putting in a pedestrian crossing because of exactly where the where the school is situated in the housing estate. Uh, because it has to be put in the right place. If it doesn't, uh, you're going to inter run into more difficulties. But there is a solution to this problem. It is on the table since 2015, and Sligo County Council and the Roads Department now need to look, look at the series. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Healy. Motion agreed. Okay, uh, moving on to item motion 16, Councillor Healy. Second, Councillor Gibbons. No, no, the attachment. I was never opened up the attachment, but this issue of hazard waste is, is an issue that I indicated back in 2016 when I was mayor. And at that time, what we did, we arranged a meeting with the council, the waste company, Bids Group, and Sligo Town, Sligo Tidy Towns to form a plan to achieve this. Uh, as we've seen here, going down through the years, we had a, a, a waste day or a, a hazard waste day where people came along and got rid of the rubbish. Uh, this was very successful on a number of occasions, and I'm asking for this to be run over again. But we need to be moving forward. We know that we have uh, a waste facility site like this in Tubba Curry, but unfortunately that only covers the Tubba Curry Valley Moat area. It doesn't cover East Sligo, and it doesn't cover North Sligo or Sligo Town itself. 
So we need to be looking at this serious. Uh, as you know, with the pandemic and the lockdown, a lot more people have been painting and doing up their houses and things like that. So there is a build up of this. The last time we had the, the open day where people could bring in their hazardous waste, the hours of that day was from nine until, until two o'clock. Unfortunately, the, the site had to close down after half 10 because of the amount of waste coming in. As I says, I wasn't able to open the rep up the report, but I'm hoping that it will be something positive. Also, um, I did write to the EPA regarding uh, the need for a facility like this, that if any waste company or anything was in the was looking to put something forward, that I would be supportive of it because I think it's something that's badly needed for Sligo. Uh, the population alone uh, needs it. So thank you. Thanks for giving. I saw a person to second the, the motion. Mm -hmm. I think we saw that realistically the reads for um, the population of Sligo itself the surrounding areas which you're taking in, the likes of North Sligo, the um, Ballastadere, Colony, um, Strand Hill, Ross Point, and it is needed. But the one thing, and I want to send out a warning in relation to this, if it is a thing that we deal with hazardous waste in Sligo, the last place that we need it is anywhere near water. I don't give a damn what anybody says. There's no sense in us going along and saying, put it down where Panda is on the docks. Because if hazardous waste, any of that leaks or anything else, the environmental damage that it will do to fish life, bird life, everything else is disastrous. The one thing that I would say, in and as well as that, the type of hazardous waste that's been taken in needs to be treated within something like a 48-hour period, that it's not lying there, a build-up or whatever else. I do know even in the likes of Carrick and Shannon and Leitrim at the moment, there is massive protests going on over the storage of batteries going on. I would not like to see the likes of that coming as hazardous waste into these areas. I mean to say when there's that many concerns in relation to it. And as for the hazardous waste, day, I would 100% agree with it. But if you did not have that on the likes of the docks, that you had that elsewhere, that a prime location is got for it, and it's needed, it means we don't run into the same problem as we happened with the last um, hazardous waste days we had. Were you with the likes of NCF on the docks, their business was being interfered with. You had the likes of the different businesses that was there, it was being interfered with because the backlog of traffic was back as far as the earth line and it was back as far as the bridge on the other road with people bringing in old paint cans, oil, everything else to get rid of it. They actually had to close down the facility in Sligo and cancel it. But the one thing I, it is needed, but we need to tread with caution in relation to this. And it needs to be uh, dealt with in an area that's going to have the least effect on the environment. I'm serious in relation to this, people. This is detrimental on the decision that is taken here in relation to it. It is needed, but we do need the right facilities and we do need the right way of treating wood. <clears throat> Not build it up. Not have it lying around the place, whatever else, but it's straight as soon as it comes in. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. Um, Mr. Gilfeather. Uh, okay, here looks just a, an administrative issue. I'm disappointed that uh, you couldn't access the report, Councillor Healy. We, we made a concerted effort this month to ensure that all the reports were circulated in one particular link and that all members it's, would be able to open them. And I know Jimmy made an offer to make himself available if people, if members couldn't, just if members might contact us if, the, if they did have a problem, because, you know, the, the idea is to get the reports out on a Friday so that the members have a chance to consider it, because you only have one hour 55. And, you know, we appreciate that you want to get through the full agenda. So if, if we're not, if, if you're not getting that information, please let us know, because it is very important that you I'm get it. Councillor Queen and yes. Yeah, could we? Yeah, well, we have difficulty getting our email or reply, or replies also. Could they not be put on our on our own email? Yeah, all, well, all the reports, all the reports, all the reports, and then we get them. We can't right. get them. Okay, we, we can do that, but the only thing, as as said, if if members that don't get them by Friday evening can let us know. It's just a, it's it's easier on the flow of the meeting. So if anyone has, has difficulty opening them or has difficulty getting them, to come back to Jimmy or Kevin. Okay? Is so we're going to put them on our own email. What's well, on our own email address? Yeah. We're yeah we'll the right, right. We'll talk about, we'll talk to the IT section after we're so. about that. Okay, moving on. Just on a point of clarity. 
Jimmy Hello. sent out the stuff on Friday. He also sent out an email yesterday on his own time, in fairness, mm. that anybody that didn't get it, I replied actually to that email when mm. I got it. And in fairness, mm. it's a fantastic system mm. and I have to commend the man on it. Mm. And mm. the one aspect, mm. Jimmy done everything possible to make yeah. sure everybody yeah. got that. Yeah. I was able to open mine. I don't know what went right, I can't speak for everybody else. Yeah. But I think it's a fantastic yeah. system. And personally, I, it's very positive. Thanks very much. No, no, yeah. is that okay, members? Carol, yeah, just okay, to, okay. Just to be, just to be clear, I, I don't think there's anyone blaming anybody. No, for not. Um, you know, we we do appreciate the work that, that Jimmy and and, and Joanne and, and everybody's doing to get the reports out and where the reports are coming from. So yeah. I, I think we just want to make that clear as well. That's it's just that we find yeah. it hard to access them. That's That's okay, okay. Well, look, the agreement is that if anyone hasn't received them, the Friday before the monthly meeting, um, by before five o'clock, don't leave it till five o'clock, check with Jimmy or Kevin, okay? And, you know, thanks in fairness, Jimmy will do what he can to get them out to everybody. I am motion number 15 uh, is dealt with motion number 16, Councillor Maguire. Thank you, Kahirak. I heard Arthur's name first, sorry. Um, thank you, Carol. I can just to come in on that last point. Um, it was me who, who emailed Jimmy yesterday, a Sunday, when he wasn't supposed to be working, and he replied immediately. And I'm very grateful for him uh, for that. I was having difficulty getting them as well. Um, in relation to this motion, um, I have received a reply. It is somewhat disappointing. Um, there has never been a greater need for safe playground amenities for children than at this moment. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Lockdown restrictions have deprived children of so many of their developmental passages and playgrounds provide them with a safe environment for their physical development and independence. Development which children need now more than ever. With lockdowns and homeschooling, sedentary and antisocial behaviours in children have been on the rise and the lack of support for playground maintenance isn't doing anything to help this. On this front, it would be a shame if because of the financial restrictions that so many community groups find themselves in, that playgrounds were to close. The loss of any community facility is a shame as it brings so much joy and enhancement to the local area and the community at large. And it would be really sad to see the close of these simply because there isn't a funding stream accessible for which it would keep and support uh, and uh, allow for renewed succession of this facility into the future. In Sligo's case, it appears that there is an equity in support for children's immunity between the urban versus the rural areas, um, right through from the procurement phase, right through the life cycle of the playground. Children who live in rural areas of Sligo have been somewhat forgotten when decisions about long-term support and funding allocations were made. There are also inequities um, in relation to the COVID emergency fund. Uh, I know some groups thought that they could use that fund to try and uh, obtain or pay for insurance but it is only available for capital items and development and so excluded ongoing expenses like insurance and maintenance. Playgrounds are at risk of closure as also their fundraising capacity which usually would have paid for uh, these services has been decimated as no longer are they available to do the usual uh, fundraising activities that they would normally have in a normal year to facilitate. Um, and also the CE schemes which uh, allowed people to be employed to trim and main maintain the playgrounds have been stopped. Um, so we really are seeing playgrounds uh, at risk at the minute. Um, and I note the position of the report. Um, that's it. Thank you. Kahirla. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. I, there was a lot of people who came in. I just heard the, you second, and I let the other speakers in. Go here. Rick. The whole thing with um, playgrounds, and it is, it's a part of child's development. They are very, they are very badly needed. That's the one aspect. If insurance isn't there, because under today's laws, it means the playground has to be closed down. A lot of these playgrounds, what it puts the insurance out through the roof is where you get a lot of vandalising going on or maybe that there's an accident in the area. And an awful lot of problems caused as well through with an awful lot of damage is underage drinkers going into these facilities in the evening. And I think myself that the full vigours of their law should be used in these cases. 
to weed these people out. But getting back to the development of the children, that was even recognised by Sligo Corporation back in the 1960s. Both myself and Councillor Grady had the pleasure of actually playing in a very good park in Tracy Avenue. There was three of them that was allocated to the town. There was one in Fort Hill above, and I'm glad to see that that one is still in Fort Hill. There was the park in Tracy Avenue, and there was the one at the, in, at the bottom of St. Joseph's. But I do feel myself in relation to it. Local authorities should be making every effort to try and help to keep these parks open. These parks are a major part of a child's life. And it has been seen, it has been seen to its full extent in the summer months that we've had in the past, especially last summer, there when people had no place to go on holidays or something else, and the park was open, the likes of Mitchell Curley Park, and we have the one over by the riverside, I know that the children's play end of it was closed off. But the one thing, and I only for the likes of those parks and the ones that we have, we have fantastic parks around Sligo Town in the urban end, and I do know we have them around the county, but only for them parks realistically, I think myself, that it just kept people's mental health kind of in place. That is the reality to it. It gave them an outlet. There was people out there that was working. They knew no other, other part of recreation as such. They worked during the day. They uh, went and done whatever they'd done in the evening. Let it be squash, let it be tennis or whatever else. But these parks gave them a new lease of life during the lockdown and especially those that had to work from home or those that had young babies, our kids. Thanks very much. Thanks, Councillor Milani. Briefly, I just want to, to compliment Councillor McGuire on her motion. I think this is a problem that's fairly widespread out there. It's exasperated by COVID, but it's a problem that we have started to see before ever COVID came. And I almost think at this stage that there needs to be a government initiative to put funding into local authorities to solve this problem. It's, con it's countrywide. I know playgrounds in different parts of the country that has the very same problem. Those playgrounds will be closed, the gates will be locked on them, there's government money in them, and so is their local money that was funded to match the, the leader funding that went to most of them. So this is a problem that's going to have to be dealt with. Our children are going to be denied the right to have a playground. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Yeah, uh, like Councillor Melania, I'll be brief. Um, this is a, an issue, I suppose, uh, I have a motion down later on, it's part of a broader issue uh, in relation to the community and voluntary sector um, who are suffering across the county um, over the last few months in particular. Um, and per in particular now, um, I want to thank Councillor Maguire for the motion. Um, there are a number of playgrounds now who are struggling to pay their insurance. Uh, and I would agree with Councillor Milani that there's a there's a wider approach needed in relation to these um, public playgrounds. Um, we have fought very hard for them. The majority of them in the rural areas came from funded through the Rural Development Programme, which in effect was Euro European money uh, that came in. We hadn't the luxury uh, of what happened in the borough where, where we could get uh, funding direct uh, from the department or from uh, the sports capital unit in the past. That isn't the case now and it won't be the case going forward. So, um, Councillor McGuire is right. Uh, there is an inequitable, an inequitable um, understanding in relation between the town uh, facilities and the rural facilities and we need a scheme uh, to directly uh, particularly in terms of the maintenance, the inspection and the annual assessment that is now required on the playgrounds. We need uh, a wider conversation about this. Uh, so I support the motion uh, in full. Thank you, Councillor Haley. Yeah, I want to support the motion too. And uh, as I says, this was something that was raised before in the council regarding playgrounds across the county. If you look at Tubbacurry, Ballantore, uh, Colony, Grange, all community involved put them together get them there. We are in serious problems now at the moment where we cannot get insurance. The insurance for the playground in Colony is coming in over 3,000. We have no money to raise to, to open up our playgrounds and that's just coming from one area. Every area is affected the same. We need a policy that brought in that the local authorities cover the insurance of these 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 groups after a number of years when they're when they're set up and they're 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 looked after and things like that. Like, the, everyone wants a playground in their towns. If you look at Tubbacurry and Colony for the size of them, and Grange for the size of them, the population in that alone, the first thing that should have been done under the, uh, under the county development plan or under any planning was make sure that they put in a playground for the areas. 
there is other areas that have them. Riverstone has a playground. Drummore West has a playground. There are certain areas. Kulani is a playground, all covered under, under by the council. But other areas isn't. So I think we need to have a serious look at this and address it once and for all. And I will count, call on, on uh, the government parties as well to look at this. And I, I thank uh, Councillor Maguire for bringing this forward. It's something that needs to be addressed once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Casserly. Uh, thank you. I'll be brief. I won't repeat what was said, but just to support the motion wholeheartedly as well. Um, we've recently had to set up a GoFundMe to, to collect funding for insurance and for maintenance as well. It's an ongoing issue. Um, everybody is pulling from the same pot of funding in, in all these communities as well. The communities, the funding for the playgrounds at the start was the match funding was raised by the communities. And when they see a playground in place, then they think and they should rightly think that that's it finished and they don't realize that there is uh, there's annual um costs associated with that and they're all public playgrounds as well there's no gate um there's no nothing to say that it's a private playground it's community it's all for the public it's open to everybody so it, it really is inequitable that some playgrounds are covered in the county and some aren't so i just like to support the motion and really hope that something is going to be done about it because it it also discourages other communities from uh, setting up committees and um, to to look at just to, to get funding for playgrounds in their communities thank you Thank you. I'll leave the final word, Councillor Maguire. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to all my colleagues for your support. Um, it's very clear this is um, something obviously that hits every community, and we as public representatives are aware um, through our engagement with the communities the importance um, for families and children, especially, um, of these facilities in their localities. Um, just as a final word, uh, Doing a bit of research on this topic, I noticed that County Tipperary and County Kerry councils um, do provide assistance um, for all playgrounds in their counties and they have established play policies. Um, but I would tend to agree with Councillor Milani that I think a national approach needs to be taken and that we need to see national funding coming um, to provide for this uh, really uh, vital um, infrastructure facility within our communities um, and that community groups are supported uh, to maintain and continue their brilliant work in establishing these for, for their own communities. So thanks again to all my colleagues. Thank you. Moving on, so motion number 17, second by Councillor Walsh. Councillor Maguire. Thank you. And I'm aware that Councillor Walsh um, brought this motion, I think, last year. Uh, and I think it's a really um, exciting possibility for us in Sligo. It really follows on, actually, from my last motion in relation to playgrounds. It's, it's for the next stage of um, the group that are growing out of the playgrounds, but still need facilities um, provided for them. Uh, and skateboarding has become a really popular uh, outdoor activity. Um, I think particularly in the lockdown, we'll have seen any bit of tarmac or concrete, you'll see um, young people out on their skateboards uh, having fun. What they really need is a proper um, facility. During last summer when I was um, on holidays in different parts of the country, I saw a few of them in action and I was just amazed at how um, full they were and how well utilised they were, much appreciated uh, by the community. I know the response, uh, and hopefully uh, this will be included. Um, I think the first step is to identify a potential place, uh, and that will be welcome, and then to look for funding for it. Um, but I think that we could provide this facility. It would be another um, aspect to our tourism draw, because it's a facility that's used by both young and older people who have um, the balance and skills uh, to use a skateboard, which unfortunately I can't. I'll say that I do. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Councillor Walsh? Yeah, uh, I want to support the motion. I had a motion down uh, with Councillor uh, O'Boyle back in November in relation to a uh, skate park uh, for County Sligo. I think it's something that should be progressed. Um, I, I know the Sports Capital programme closes at 5 pm today. Um, and hopefully we will get an opportunity to make application for funding for this um, in next year's round uh, because we don't have one uh, outdoor, we don't have an outdoor skate park in the county. Most other local authorities now 
uh, have one. Um, I understand it's been considered for uh, Olympics. Uh, it's a sport that's grown and progressively grown across the country and across Europe. Um, and uh, it cert certainly would be a welcome amenity. I know we had proposed Cleavra, um as a potential location back in uh, November. So uh, I wholeheartedly support, support this motion. Uh, I know I've met with students that have done some research uh, on this from IT Sligo, um, and I've met with a number of young people who are in the process of forming a committee uh, to bring this uh, forward in the county, so um, who they would have an interest in it. So I would be hoping that we get an assessment done uh, sooner uh, rather than later, uh, and that we carry out a consultation in, in relation to uh, the provision of, uh, of a location. But uh, we have a lot of space in Cleavra. It would make sense uh, in relation to that uh, hub uh, in that area at Cleavra. So um, I welcome the motion and I fully support it, and I'm delighted to see it still uh, on the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. Go here, look, I have a great interest in this because, and a lot of people would have remembered on the borough, this was something that was brought up when we were doing the whole development of uh, over Calivra. And I know Rosalie, Councillor Rosalind Grady is here, Councillor McCharry is here, and it was brought up on a number of occasions. I actually had the motion down. And at the time, we asked the Park Superintendent, Mion Condren, if there was the possibility of including it. But like everything else, he was dependent on Dorm at the Council at the time, was to use funding. That's where he was dipping it for funding, and he had to use it wisely, and it just didn't fit into the criteria. The second project, and we brought it up, and it was adopted and agreed by Sligo Borough Council, and it's just. Uh, Councillor O'Grady actually reminded me of it there was where the old swimming pool was in Sligo because again that was another project that was taken on by Sligo Borough Council under the office of Meol Condren and Meol again was seeking funding for are under the dormant funds, but it is something that's ongoing. Now, I do know my party colleague, Chris McManus, had brought it up. I know Rosalind O'Grady had brought it up on an occasion or two in the council. It was something that was a united front in relation to having installed, and it's such a pity that it didn't uh, come about. But I do know that my party colleague, Chris McManus, was involved with the setting up of the indoor one over in Cleaver. I don't know if that's still on the go. Yeah. Young Neville Dunbar was involved with it, and it was a massive success with summer schools and things like that. And especially with our inclement weather, it kind of made more sense to have it under a roof instead of out in the open. Now, don't take me wrong, I still feel there is a need for a good skateboarding park there, open air, Kids can have rough and tumble. That's the reality. And even as I, as you say yourself, it's not just a sport for children. There's more and more people. There's teenagers. And as you know, kind of in this day and age, kind of male teenagers kind of go into their 50s, you know, before they kind of realise that. But um, no, I'd have to support the motion. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Quain, and have you indicated? In the uh, no, no. Hold on. No. Can you hear me, Got here, though? Yes, have you skateboard in there? No, we have everything else for that. Uh, I support the most, but I, I think in a school will be an ideal location for this this uh, winter, Councillor McGuire. I know she'll support me. Where? In a school. In a school. For the okay. Right. In I would support Councillor Quinn on that. <laughs> Right. And we want one in North Sligo as well. <laughs> Just through the chair, uh, I'm in support of the the skateboard, but it is, could we have it that it could be multi purpose? That it could be used for mountain bikes and things like that? We have ground available in Colony that we would be willing to work with in relation to creating uh, something like a skateboard park plus a mountain bike. Uh, facility. Uh, as you see, we're sitting there right beside um, the Colani. Colani, where they have they're doing a great project. If if Colony was able to come on more than that, and then you have the greenway from Inniskillen to from Colony to Inniskillen, I think we might be in. And as you all know, Colony is sitting right in the heart of of, Sli of Sligo. I think we might have an opportunity there. As I say, there is a group of people there willing to look at it, and. If Sligo County Council is going to come on board, it doesn't. It says in the county, so as it says, that might be a proposal as well. Mm. Uh, I think that there's been a multi-purpose thing, not just for skateboards, that we can get multiple use out of it. I think that's the way we should be looking at it. Um, Thank you, Councillor Casterly. 
Yeah, I'd just like to support the motion as well, and I'll be lobbying for it to be in North Sligo. Any anyone else? I suppose every part of the county is going to stake it, uh, a claim to want an escape board park. So, and, and I come back in here. three parks. Three is three enough. Well, one the grant. I'll finish with Councillor Maguire as the proposer of the motion. Thank you, and thanks to all my colleagues again for your support on this. Um, it, it's great to see that it's such a popular idea. Um, and one obviously that has been around for a while. Um, but I think we've really seen the growth in the popularity of it over the last number of years. And uh, personally, I'd like to thank the students from sixth class in um, Scholasticus and Strand Hill, who wrote to me after this was last before the council, asking me to push for, for it and um, bring it to the council's attention and try to have it brought to fruition. Um, so that for me was a really positive moment to see students at that level engaging um, with us as a council. Um, so if we can at all uh, fulfill their dreams and create this facility, I think it will be welcome in every section uh, from Enniscrone to, to Grange and obviously Strand Hill in between. Um, I think all of the uh, young people would be delighted with it. I, I, I'm interested um, in Councillor Healy's suggestion of a mixture of mountain bike and um, and skateboard park. I don't know enough about it, but I'm sure that could be investigated during the assessment process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, so members to motion 18. Can I just thanks? Can I just inform you that it's 10 to 11, so we're getting through them. But if we can keep the the discussions brief. We'll try and get everything covered. Uh, Thanks. Thank you, Cahirlik. Um Yeah, a number of people uh, contacted me in the Strand Hill area about this uh, serious issue, and in advance of the meeting, I uploaded the motion onto the local uh, Strand Hill Notice, Notice uh, Board Facebook, and I was uh, very heartened that there was up to 60 replies publicly, and I got a number of private messages in relation to it, which to me indicates uh, how strongly people feel about this issue in the area, and while I thank Siobhan for her report, just I suppose a couple of obser observations. Unfortunately, signage is great in stencils, but they have low impact. Uh, the receptacles with bags do work in places. I know uh, I would have been involved in, in the, the, the placement of receptacles on the promenade in Ross's Point, and over time they have become very <coughs> successful. And I note that the residents in the Strand Hill area have identi maybe identified maybe another three or four locations for receptacles with bags. So I do think that they, they are. Uh, they do work, um, but um, I think what we all want, uh, gauging from the response I've got, and it's not just specific to the Strand Hill, I got a lot of uh, messages, people in Caluni, there's no receptacles in Caluni, there's only one public bin I'm hearing, and right across uh, the town. And I think what people really want to see uh, is prosecutions now at this stage, if at all possible. I'm not aware, uh, and maybe the, 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 the top table could advise me on this, has there ever been a prosecution under Section 22 of the Litter Pollution Act uh, for dog fouling? Uh, and if not, I think it is time that we maybe grasp that nettle and push that nuclear button because I think it is something that will have a, a, a strong uh, impact that seems to be desired by a number of people. Thank you, Cahirlik. Thank you, Councillor Grady. Thank you, Cahirlik. As the seconder of the motion, I too have been contacted by people from the Strand Hill area because of the issue of dog, dog fouling. And I suppose it has never become more apparent sin, since a lot of us are walking a lot more than before the pandemic. But it's not just an issue in Strand Hill. I think it's an issue all over. And um, I'd say everybody around the county can identify uh, with this with this problem. My understanding is that there has been one or one or two um, people have been have been in this area have been um, brought to justice on it. And I know it's a very, very difficult uh, thing to to uh, keep a check on. But I do think uh, it's a huge issue at the moment, especially during this time of pandemic when we're all out walking far more than we ever walked. And are, Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Thank you, Cahirlik. 
Um, this is uh, something obviously that has come to national attention in the last number of weeks. Um, so it's not only a county-wide issue, but also a national issue. Um, and I think I, I agree with my colleagues. I think prosecution and further education are the way to go. Um, from what I'm told, it appears to be a few repeat offenders who create a lot of the difficulty. Um, so people who have never gotten into the habit of cleaning up after their dog and allowing them to foul uh, wherever they want and um, and never and never cleaning up after and um, you'll have all heard me giving out um, both on radio and in this chamber before about the other type of offender um who who decide to put um the, the dog waste in a bag but then leave it either on a wall um or hang it from a tree or put it into a bush um, which for me is is worse, I think, nearly effectively encapsulating the dog fowl. And I don't know who they think is going to come around after them and pick it up and put it into a bin. Um, I, I, I think the stenciling is a good idea and um, people have asked me that it would be renewed in, Str in Strand Hill. So I'm delighted uh, to hear that's going to happen. That was part of the uh, countywide programme that we a couple of months um, and it, it does refresh it in people's memory when they see it on the footpath. Um, but uh, as I say, sometimes we just have repeat offenders who won't uh, won't stop. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Cahirlach. I wish to be recorded as dissenting from motions 18, 19, 21, 22 and 23. Those motions cannot be described as essential under COVID-5 restrictions. They also could be dealt with at the Municipal District of at Sligo Strand Hill. Uh, that is, uh, dissenting from motions 18, 19, 21, 22 and uh, 23. I want to compliment the councillors from the Municipal District of Benimo Chubber-Curry for keeping those type of motions at the local Municipal District. I want to thank the media, the Champion, the Weekender and the Ocean FM for giving us coverage at those uh, meetings. And I want to thank Kevin Kalrivi, for uh, the Administrator, for delivering that service to us, that we have that media coverage. I think that this Council should not be sending out the message that we can deal as, uh, with those type of motions under Level 5 restrictions of COVID-19. And we're sending the wrong message to the public health officials and the frontline workers dealing with these type of issues when they cannot be dealt with under those restrictions. Yeah. Here, here. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Gibbons. Go here, look. I remember a time in Sligo and in this country, and I think everyone around this table would be old enough to remember, when dogs roamed free on our streets. People opened their doors, let them out, and that was it. But we got a dog warden in place and the law wasn't long changing, or the attitude wasn't long changing. Dogs, you don't see them wandering the streets anymore because they're lifted and there's a good fine that goes with it. I also witnessed a number of years ago receptors being put in at Ross's Point, Strand Hill and all the beauty places around Sligo. I also remember the pooper scoopers, as they were known as, being provided for nothing. If anybody needed any, they could call downstairs to that office or to the front desk and it's the same with the borough. And they were there, they were handing out bales, small bales about that size of them. And yet, the litter, the uh, dog litter that was on the promenade at the likes of Ross's Point at the time, and around Strand Hill and whatever else, people just wouldn't go through the trouble of using them. They were supplied, they were supplied there on the beach front for them. The receptors to take them away was there, they would not use them. Now, thank God. There's a small minority, or a small um, minority today, of people that still has that frame of mind. And I think what needs to be done in relation to it is what was actually suggested here. Educating people is one thing. Everybody knows the damage uh, that dog uh, feces will do. It can leave people blind, whatever else. Everybody's aware of that. But they'll still go away and leave it there, stuck to people's shoes, people are carrying it into their homes where there's young children, everything else. The only way to deal with this is have legislation changed to bring in stiffer penalties that when somebody is reported for the likes of this, that there's a hefty fine. And if it goes to the court, let it work on the same as what the driving offences and everything else works at. You face the chances if it goes into court is a double the fine or triple of what the fine is. 
but it needs to be the only way that I can actually see this being resolved for that selfish minority that is out there. And it is a selfish minority that it actually go away and uh, leave their dogs droppings on the path and carry on like nothing's happened. And that is not their responsibility. They need to be taught a lesson. And that lesson needs to be taught. I witnessed elderly people going with their little dogs for a walk. And if they were able to clean up after their dogs, mm -hmm. and then you get these, I, I wouldn't even try and describe them, people with dogs they can't even control. They're like the pit bull terriers and whatever else. And they're normally, how would you call it? I it's, don't believe that. How not to make like this? No, talk. but I'm just stating there's a certain type of people that will actually go around with those dogs. Mm -hmm. And they are the very ones, I'm not saying that's the total case, but nine times out of ten, they're the ones that you will see their dogs defecating the footpaths and they'll walk on like nothing's happened. You'll see it even in around Sligo Town. Right. Oh, thanks. The, law, the law needs to deal with it. Thanks. Yeah. Councillor Roy, I'll let you finish on this because it's, it's, um, it's 11 o'clock members now and we're not through yet. Yeah, right. Thanks very, much. Thanks very much, Cahir. Look, um, yes, I think this motion is applies to every part of the county, and I think to say anything else is is just tomfoolery. Um, the dogs should all be chipped, and quite literally, if our warden or the guardy can take bring out a, a scanner and identify the dog when when they see the incident, we should have someone out there to try and catch it. Not just in Strand Hill, but in every place from Mullockmore to Enniscrone and everything in between, and it should be done. And if the dog has no chip, they should be lifted, full stop. That's the law, let's enforce it. Um, so fully behind it, but we need to do it in all areas. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Councillor McSharry is the proposer. Uh, yeah, just, just for clarification, and thank, I want to thank my colleagues for, for their input, but the legislation is there, the act is there, the section is there, and I'm just wondering, has there been any fines issued or prosecutions that succeeded by way of conviction under this legislation since 1997? Maybe I'll just come in here and yes, Seymour, thanks. I, I, I can't answer that, Councillor McSharry, but I'll certainly um, investigate and come back to you over the next couple of days. Um, but I, I, can I just make a point that, I mean, there's uh, there, there has been, uh, you know, a lot more complaints about dog fouling. There's a lot more dogs and there's a lot more people walking during the lockdown. So it's inevitable that there's more complaints. But I'd also ask the public themselves to, to be, you know, visible and what, you know, people, people can see people dog fouling as well. And maybe some community responsibility as well might might help the, the situation thank you um wow. can, I, can i just can i just say um and thank uh, i want to thank Ms. concannon and this is not directed at her but this motion was flagged there's the the county council website states clearly that there is legal recourse in relation to offenders and today that we don't even know that there was any fines issued or successful convictions as a result, I think, is a very poor indictment on the council. I just want to say that. Okay, um, moving on. Motion number 19, Councillor Council Macharry, second by Councillor Grady. Thank you, uh, Cahirlik, and I'll be very brief. I want to welcome the report. Uh, I have to say it's extremely positive. And from the outset, I want to compl compliment Sligo County Council and the outdoor staff and everybody who was involved in this great initiative, because in 2007, they were very successful and they changed the landscape of the area in Dorley Park with the outdoor gyms, and they did a, an absolutely superb and fantastic job. And now more than ever in these challenges, in times that has been uh, outlined earlier with other motions, uh, outdoor exercise and activity is of paramount importance. So I do welcome the fact that, uh, that uh, following an audit, the Council will shortly commence the process of inviting tenders for the phased replacement of outdoor exercise equipment at this location. And I would like that to go out loud and clear because I think that is great news and I think a lot of people will be delighted to hear that. And I want to thank uh, the, the Council Executive who are involved in this. Thank you, Councillor O'Grady. I support, uh, this is a very busy urban uh, area and being used again, as has been said previously, during this pandemic time, it's getting more use than ever, and I fully support the motion. 
Thank you. Motion number 20, mm -hmm. Councillor so McCarry, second, second by Councillor Gilroy. Uh, thank you, Cahirlach. Um Again, and uh, I think nearly every councillor now, uh, at some stage or another, has raised concerns uh, outlined by the Fort Hill uh, Men's Group, uh, who I have to say, Unfortunately, Cahirlach, it would appear to have lost confidence in this process, and that's that's sad, uh, to, to be frank, about it. And uh, one thing that they are concerned about is that the, the Greenford Conservation Plan was adopted in December 2017, and they feel that it has a five-year uh, um, uh, lifespan. And I want clarification, is that the case? Because if it is the case, we are rapidly running out of time. We have effectively from 17 to either uh, to, to 2022, and unfortunately, and it's not sinister in any way, and any of the councillors that have, uh, uh, well, nearly all the councillors that have engaged with the Fort Hill Men's Group know that they're a great organisation, their bona fides cannot be questioned, they're passionate about, passionate about what they believe needs to happen here. And uh, they, they feel that there, there might be uh, uh, some attempt to run down the clock on this. And I want to assure those people that that is not the case. And I would like a commitment uh, uh, by way of guarantee from the executive today that this uh, uh, conservation plan will be implemented within the five-year span. And if not, that we will get an extension to allow it being implemented if the, the COVID um, scenario uh, plays a part in that. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Councillor Gilroy. Uh, to, I'd like to second the motion and just as chair of the Heritage Forum, this has come up at the Heritage Forum a number of times. Um, progress is being made, but it is slow. There was a contractor appointed as the, as the response states there. A contractor had been uh, appointed, but under the COVID restrictions, uh, vegetation work and that is not allowed uh, until April and then it's not allowed in the bird nesting season until the 31st of August. So unfortunately there's a short time scale to do this over the winter months and this year because of Covid it wasn't able to be done but it is on the agenda of the Heritage Forum at each meeting and the Heritage Office I, I, I'd like to commend them for the work they've done on Ascension Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can, can I get a response from, um, I don't know if Ms Clark is still online or somebody from the executive that this uh, conservation plan will be implemented and that, the, the, that there's a guarantee that that will happen. Ms Clark? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah you can hear me, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'd, um, I'd like to confirm um, that the conservation plan for the Green Fort will be implemented. The five year, it's a five year plan, it's a five year implementation plan. Okay, it might have been agreed in 2017 but the it's really only going to kick start from march onwards so the five-year time scale will be from then on so if the the document can be reviewed during the course of the next five years um but it's a five-year implementation plan from when it starts and it will be implemented the working group is or the steering committee uh, will be put in place once we get the two members from the municipal district and we hope to do that at the municipal district meeting and the date that has been set for the first meeting is the 26th of march thank you motion number 21 councillor o'grady thank you Cahir. second thank you uh Cahir, look and i'm really heartened here this morning to hear all the a talk from different councillors on the importance of outdoor facilities, from skate parks, skate parks to to insurance on parks. And um, I'm delighted uh, because we never needed outdoor facilities more than we need them now. I put down this motion uh, as regards the Dorley Park uh, uh, playground. I happen to go to it. It's one place I can meet my grandchildren in the open. And it's an extremely, extremely busy urban rural park with gym facilities and play facilities uh, for children. On one occasion while I was there, eight people came to me complimenting uh, the park provision, but also asking, would I table a motion uh, to request uh, that picnic tables would be put in there? So 
thus motion number 21. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, with the response that I have got from uh, our senior engineer that it will be considered, that picnic tables will be considered in the overall context of the programme 2021. And this is not something that we can leave uh, on the long finger because the weather is getting better. I would hope that they will be supplied in plenty of time uh, for the summer for the summer months. And never was play parks more important, as previous speakers have said, uh, for the ongoing development of our children, whom we all are concerned about, uh, their lack of schooling, their lack of social interaction uh, with people. And that is a concern to all parents and indeed all families. Mm -hmm. And this facility at Dorley Park, I really want to acknowledge uh, the Parks Department for the work that they have done, because not alone is there facilities for children who have all their faculties, but there's facilities for children with physical disability. And I think that's fabulous that a child, regardless of their physical disability, can go and integrate. So I leave a huge importance on this motion. Uh, I was asked to put it forward by the people who have elected me. And I'm here long enough uh, to be wise enough to know to put down um, motion if people feel very strongly for it. Um, certainly, uh, it's a motion that could be dealt with at the municipal district, but that would be leave it uh, time, um, a, a greater time uh, for it. So I'm delighted that this motion has been tabled, and I'm also delighted uh, that the engineer has come back to me with an extremely positive uh, report that the people of this urban area and county uh, can come and picnic in the wonderful facility that we have in Dorley Park. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McSherry. Uh, yes, uh, I'd just like to support the motion uh, as well. It's something that we've all, uh, any of us that use the area or in the area, um, it's something that would, uh, you know, would be hugely beneficial. Uh, the only caution is the, the obvious one, that it wouldn't be a situation that it might attract uh, um, antisocial behaviour at certain locations. But uh, I do think certainly at the main focus and the bigger uh, uh, playground beside the car park, I think if there was picnic tables there, especially at the weekend, they would be utilised and used for all the right purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. Coherlik, I want to support the motion. I think it's a very important motion. And I feel that with the COVID-19 pandemic that we have upon us at the moment, I really feel that we should be encouraging our people, instead of travelling to beaches outside of their five-mile area or whatever else, to use the, util or the facilities that we have, the likes of those parks, the likes of Dooley Park, and other parks around, the parks throughout the county. I think myself that it is a part that the council can play. It wouldn't cost an arm and a leg, I mean to say, in relation to install them. Maybe the installation would actually cost more than the, the benches themselves putting them in. But I think myself that it is a welcome site anywhere people go. I don't know if people here are familiar with Forest Park in Boyle. If you go there and the amount of uh, benches that's there and the amount of people that they attract and people having barbecues, things like that and whatever else. And that's a facility there beside a lake. We have a facility that's there beside a lake. It's beside a river. It can be fished. Everything else that's there, and I really feel myself that it's it's a word it's a wordy enough um, motion. I give it a one hundred percent support. Thanks very Thank much. you. Now, members, moving on. Motion number twenty-two. Just inform me, is ten past eleven? Okay. Well, I not to take much of your Second. time. Uh, again, uh, the, I am aware that the parking can't be extended in there because of an SSC and all of that in the area. But because of the numbers of people coming, uh, especially at this pandemic time, to use the car park, I have requested that the, it would be cleaned up and that lines will be put in place. Uh, parking... Um, uh, parking lines so that people... I observed on one occasion there where a person had taken up three spaces by parking lengthways. So I think if it was lined, uh, it, would in, it would encourage people to park properly. Uh, as of now, people are crossing the road and parking in other facilities and it leaves it dangerous uh, for children and whatever coming forward. So I welcome the report that uh, it's going to be upgraded and that markings will be put in place. And again, 
I feel this is extremely important in this <coughs> pandemic time that that will be sorted out. Thank you, Cahirla. Thank you, Councillor McSharry. Thank you. And members 23, Councillor Grady again. Councillor Gibbons. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Cahir. Look, uh, the Mitchell Curley Park has been a wonderful, absolutely wonderful uh, development out in the West Ward, used by town and country, it's uh, uh, people coming to it. Uh, but again, it needs some upgrading of the playground facilities. Now, I'm most thankful uh, for the report. Uh, I understand uh, that uh, the lighting, uh, which Councillor Maguire had a motion down about the lighting in, in uh, Mitchell Curley Park, um, that the lighting will be first of all addressed and that the surface of the areas will be addressed and then that the ongoing upgrading of the play facilities uh, would be looked at. And I really emphasise the need for facilities for children with physical disability. I think there's nothing nicer to see children with physical disability integrated with other children as they play. And we had that facility in Dorley Park, but it's not special Curly Park. So I'm most thankful and um, I think it was important to bring this issue uh, to the table here uh, because it impacts on a lot of people's lives in this very difficult time for families, especially families with young children. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. As a second of the motion, I'll be quick in relation to this. Uh, as Councillor O'Grady says there, that there's a number of issues there that's kind of just need addressing in it. But the one thing that I would say in relation to Mitchell Curley Park and other parks around, doesn't matter where about in Sligo it is, if it is a thing that there's a programme, a maintenance programme carried out on these parks, a lot of the equipment in them will not fall into this repair. And they do need upgrading and whatever else. But the one thing is like everything else, we can't just build a park, leave it there and hope that it's going to last that way forever. It does need maintenance. And it might be something to look at maybe that a member of staff or a maintenance staff or something else or somebody's employed to go around and carry out the maintenance on these parks. I think we still have the money well spent. Thanks very much. If... Um I just want to, and before I conclude as proposer of, of those three motions, I want to acknowledge the fabulous work that has been done by Sligo Borough Council in the past and Sligo County Council. If we were in the situation 20 years ago that we're in now with the pandemic, we wouldn't have the outdoor facilities that we have. You have Dorley Park, Mitchell Curley Park, you have Cleaver, and there has been wonderful work done uh, by the Parks Department. So I want to acknowledge that and thank you for Thank you, Councillor Maguire. Oh, sorry. Councillor Maguire. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like to support the motion. Um, Mitchell is a great uh, facility. Um, it's really short. Oh. Very short. Yeah. Okay, are a bit um, old and actually rusted at, at this point, um, so they do need to be upgraded. Um, just on that vein, and uh, also in the same vein that Councillor really finished there, um, I'd like to acknowledge the work of the Park Service. Um, there was great work done, particularly early in the recent months, uh, where um, an area at the bottom of the slide, which was constantly flooded, uh, has been replaced with some appropriate material, and it's really uh, a, a great improvement, and it's been much enjoyed by um, many, many children throughout lockdown. So just to support the motion and thank the Park Services for their work there. Thank you. Um, members, now it's a quarter past 11, and I think in fairness, I'm just going to acknowledge everyone that has spoken and the people that have to speak, but we're going to try and get it completed. So if we can keep the contributions as short as possible, I think it's only fair to the people that are at the end of the motions. Number, motion 24, Councillor Clark, second by Councillor Healy. Councillor Clark. Can you hear the can now, yeah? Can you hear me now, Chairman? Yes. Right. Chairman, just to confirm that I've been uh, recorded as a sitting on, on motions 18, 19, 21, 22 and 23. Uh, we have over 5,000 people attending Dunmorden Beach where there's absolutely no facilities, no toilets, football teams training there and people going for walks every evening and we have nothing out there. And for this meet, count, county meeting to be halved in such a way is disgraceful. 
We have one councillor speaking there for over 15 minutes, and now we're at over an hour and 10 minutes got out of the meeting, and half the agenda not covered. My motion here in relation to, it's all about confidence in the housing section of Side County Council and councillors councils all over the country. The Minister's proposal now is to remove any local input, local consultation, local decision making, local imp 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 input by the people that elect, that elect us to, to represent them locally, to put the power in a few people, unoffic un unelected officials, governed by the Minister, is a disgrace. And I hope that every councillor will support this motion unanimously. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Haley. Councillor uh, Clerk on this motion. If if the Minister puts enough money towards local uh, local authority houses, direct funding into large scale houses, we can deliver it. Sligo County Council has shown in the past that if they are given the funding that they are And also, this mean that this if this happens, it'll also cut the powers of us, us as councillors. So we need to stand up and be counting on this issue. This is a serious issue that will have a serious effect on us moving forward into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Boyle. Um, thank you, Chair Boyle, myself and Councillor Boyle want to speak. So, um, thank you. The government is pushing through a bill to create a land development agency and its main purpose is the privatisation of public land. The new agency will remove control of local authority land from elected councillors. They will do deeds with private developers, but these will remain secret, protected by commercial secrecy. The chair of the Land Development Agency, John Moran, thank you not over John Moran, has an interest in history. He is a former CEO for Zura Capital Markets. The his tenure as CEO, the firm was fined over 16 million by the US Securities and Exchange Commission for aid and abetting four hedge funds. He was appointed Secretary of the Department of Finance between 2011 and 2014. After he took up that post, contact between the Irish state and vulture funds increased dramatically. Officials from the department met with the representatives of the private equity funds no less than 65 times between 2013 and 2014. This is a staggering level of contact and sharp contrast to a tiny number of meetings, five, held with groups advocating for mortgage holders. It's an indication of what has to come with the Land Development Agency. One of the main buyers in Ireland's current housing market is large vulture, large vulture funds who are buying up property for rental income. The biggest of these funds is Canadian owned Irish REIT which is now the state's largest private landlord with just under 4,000 rental properties. A recorded 30% increase in net rental income in its latest half year results despite the pandemic. Yet despite this, Irish REIT pays hardly any tax. In 2019, Irish REIT reported a profit of 86 million and paid no tax on it. Zero. The Land Development Agency is likely to sell off public land to these vultures on the pretext that they are increasing housing supply. The reality, however, is that we are being fleeced with high rents and most young people are no longer be able to buy a house. There is a better way to stay cut back on a massive program of housing building on public land. They could build huge numbers of social housing to tackle Ireland's continuing housing crisis, and they could create a scheme for genuinely affordable houses. I support the motion fully. Thank you, Councillor Bray. Uh, the, the Land Development Agency bill, I believe, represents the latest attack by Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael and the Greens on local democracy and local government in Ireland. In advance of last year's general election, Cahirna, you remember that Fianna Fáil spoke about empowering local government and restoring borough and town councils. However, their housing minister and the government is introducing this new legislation to bypass the democratically elected members of local authorities and allow the council executive to transfer council lands to the land development agency without requiring a council vote. And while this is great news for property developers and speculators who want to get their hands on public lands, it represents a dark day for local democracy. It will facilitate the privatisation of public land through the back door. And it will allow developers to buy public lands and then build full market price houses on 40% of the land. I firmly believe, Cahira, that all houses built on public land should be public council houses or affordable housing. I, I commend Councillor Clark for bringing forward the motion. Okay, thank you. Agreed. Councillor Haley? With Councillor Clark's permission, I think that this should be sent to all 31 other local authorities as well, this motion. Mr. Clark, send it to all the other, all the other councils. 
Absolutely, Cahirlo. Can I? I'd like to, to thank the contribution of the members. This is a serious attack on on, on, our, on our council and our and, and our ability to represent the people that we're elected to represent. And I'd like to thank them all for support. Thank you. Count, uh, motion twenty five. Councillor Wall second. second. Councillor Haley. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Cahirlo. Um, and um, I suppose this is a very urgent um, issue in relation to one of our most scenic areas in the county. Um, prior to the start of uh, an anticipated very domestic uh, tourism season, uh, well, at least the second half of the summer at Ross's Point, we've seen a huge increase last year, uh, and that is likely to be increased upon uh, this year. So, a um, number of residents uh, and the Development Association at Ross's Point have concerns in relation to a number of things, I suppose, from last year's uh, increase in traffic uh, and um, domestic tourism uh, um, relative to speed on the main road, speed on the old, old Ross's Point Road, um, the condition of the public toilets and the lack of a disabled toilet, um, uh, and uh, the parking, illegally parked camper vans on the road down uh, to the beachfront. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to say we had a very progressive meeting this week uh, with the engineer and the team um, um, on Tuesday last, uh, and I want to thank Emer Concanon's team for that because uh, we got through a, an awful lot in an hour and a half uh, in what was effectively a storm in Russell's Point. So uh, I want to thank the, the engineers that uh, met with the Development Association. Um, I welcome the response to a point, but uh, it's important that we progress uh, the toilets. I understand there is going to be um, a disabled toilet, which will be a wooden frame disabled toilet uh, inserted uh, at Ross's Point this year. Uh, it's important there's a cleaning contract put in place um, with the other facilities in the county um, for the facility and that we address uh, the parking facility in relation to the road leading down to the beachfront uh, and the car park. Um, we had a huge amount of issues there last year, weekend upon weekend, where there was fires started in the grass. Um, there was 12 guards had to deal with an issue at one point uh, in that car park uh, uh, on one of the nights, and a huge increase in litter tipping uh, and dumping at the beachfront, uh, beachfront. So we have to address that by way of regulation or not, uh, but uh, we need to find a solution to the illegal parking um, leading to the beachfront and overnight parking in that area. Um, I understand that the 100,000 that was allocated by government is going to tender in the very near future, uh, and we should be appointing a design team for the realm works at Russell Point. It, it would be important that we facilitate uh, camper van parking um, as part of that, uh, and that we have a regulation like we have in Dingle, where camper vans pay for their parking. We should be introducing something like that uh, in our uh, seaside villages where you can park safely, have access to the services, uh, and um, not obstruct any other um, vehicles uh, from entering the beach area. So I welcome uh, the reply. It's important we have a date for those toilets opening and that the condition of them are, are improved uh, at Ross Point. Thank you. Kerr. Thank you, Councillor Haley. So well, well, uh, welcome to the reply. It's an ongoing issue. It started last year with uh, the says camper vans. Remember camper vans also breed tourism. I'm a camper van myself and uh, you have to have the right facilities in place as well. There is land there one side out that the council owned. I've raised it with the engineer to see was it possible to, for a couple of areas to be put in there. I think we, we have an opportunity here now to uh, make money as well as bringing people into the area. And it's the local authority who has the opportunity to do it. As it says, it doesn't take a lot. Uh, camper vans come with their own toilets and all, all they need is a facility to empty their toilets. Uh, as it says, I think we have an opportunity here to uh, encourage more people to come to the west of Ireland and to our areas, but it's down to us to make sure we have the right facilities in place for them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Casterly. Um, 
Thank you. I'll be brief. I'd just like to support the motion as well. Um, this, I've, I've raised these issues before as well. Uh, it's Ross Point. It's a beautiful town. I know that there is funding being made available for improvements there um, over the next few months as well. But just to support the motion, um, particularly on the the illegally parked camper vans that it was brought raised an awful lot um, during last summer in particular, and residents were very worried and very upset about it at the time. So I welcome the report and that the works are going to be carried. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Yeah, can you hear me, Dara? Can I hear look? Yeah. Yeah, no, just uh, when you're on about the with the toilets, um, I had a motion down before, but it should be considered that to be a change in area for, for adults with disability because I don't think we have anyone in the county and it's an essential thing now, so... Uh, I had it down before, so if that could be considered whatever work they're doing with disabled toilets, if that is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, agreed. Motion 26, Councillor Walsh. Second, Councillor Mullaney. Yeah. Uh, can you hear, look, this is a very serious uh, situation that's developing across this county and many other counties across the country. Um, I welcome the reply to a point, but uh, it's what we know already. We know what schemes are in place um, throughout the COVID. We know there was a COVID emergency response scheme. We know this community enhancement programme was adapted for community groups. Mm -hmm. But these schemes were adapted for community groups to in turn help their communities. There's a serious situation with the sect Section 59 sector across the state. Um, they have they have led the way. There have been principals in their area and guardians of their communities since last March over the COVID pandemic. Uh, and they now need help because we are going to wipe out the community and voluntary sector if they're not supported. This is a very, very serious situation. Uh, they cannot afford to pay electricity bills for halls, heating, uh, lighting, uh, insurance, uh, PPE, uh, and there's a lack of support for this sector, uh, and it's coming up across the country. There's over 400 community groups in this county. Uh, they're the backbone of the county, and anyone that doesn't realise how serious this situation is, we, we will wipe out. We don't need signs on roads any longer. We, the Community Response Forum needs to make this the number one issue. Spending money any longer on advertising isn't justifiable. We have community groups now go into credit unions to borrow money to keep electricity, lights and their insurance paid. It isn't good enough any longer to see road signs up uh, at a rental cost every week when we have community groups that have uh, taken care, delivered shopping, um, um, brought fuel to older people in their communities since last March, carried out chores for them, uh, been leaders, as I say, in their communities, and now they need help. There has been no scheme specifically targeted to help the community and voluntary sector and pay their fixed recurring costs uh, in this county. I've raised it with the PPN. The Secretariat is aware of it. They've raised it nationally. I've raised it with the Minister. Uh, and we will wipe out our community and voluntary sector if we don't do something about this now. Uh, this should be the number one issue at the community response. There's a number of stakeholders on it. And if it isn't, we're doing something wrong. And it's coming up across the country. It needs to be addressed. For example, St. Michael's Family Life Centre will struggle to keep their electricity on uh, on Churchill. They're a counselling service, they provide AA um, counselling, they provide counselling to Narcotics Anonymous, uh, and they're going to struggle to pay their utility bills, like other community halls across the, the country. And playgrounds were mentioned earlier. It's, it's just starting. Uh, and as the longer this pandemic goes on, uh, we will wipe out the community and voluntary sector, which the local authority will not be able to step in, in for uh, if we continue. We need to provide funding uh, for their utilities and fix recurring costs. We've done it for the business sector. Uh, we've done it for the self-employed. We've done it for people who've let, been let go out of their jobs. And if we don't do it for the community and voluntary sector, the local authority will pay a big price uh, going forward. Thank you. Councillor Mullaney. Yeah, All right. Just to agree with Councillor Walsh, I think he has covered it for, very well. The community and voluntary sector is the people that has kept community alive in rural Ireland, not just in this county. And if there isn't a government initiative to see if this sector, it will no longer exist. Thanks.
Thank you, Councillor Gilroy. Again, uh, to agree with everything that's said, I suppose as, as Treasurer of the Volunteer Centre, we worry uh, about paying our own ESP bill and, and rent. Uh, it's right across the board um, that these worries are there. And uh, to support that, a lot of groups are very, very concerned about being able to exist even in 2022. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maguire. Thank you, for here. Um I just want to welcome this motion um, I think it's very timely and I think Councillor Walsh has outlined it very clearly. Um, just to add that uh, factor for um, community and voluntary groups is that they usually fundraise um, to cover the cost of these and they've been prevented from doing that. Um, so they are really caught in a very difficult place. They are the heartbeat of their communities. They're the people who go out and volunteer for others who um, create the events, create the facilities help support uh, badly needed services in the community, all on their own back. Um, and as Councillor Walsh has pointed out, our government have stepped in and we have supported businesses and we have supported other uh, sectors of the, of the economy who have suffered. But we really now need to have something in place that isn't for capital funding. That is the problem. A lot of the supports, or the funding that has come on the stream has related to capital funding, and that's not where the problem lies currently. And um, so I fully and wholeheartedly support the motion. Yeah, thanks. And I too would like to be associated with the motion and, and support it. I had a community hall on to me that face is their electricity being cut off because their standing order for their electricity is just coming out every month out of the building. They too were unable to hold anything um, and they face a complete um, wipe out of their account and I agree fully with the motion. Motion number 27, Councillor Walsh and Councillor Gilroy. Thank you, Cahirlock. Um, this has been an ongoing issue uh, last year um, where we had a port uh, on the um, the verge leading into Mullagmore uh, for the summer period last year because the public toilets weren't fit for purpose uh, and we hadn't uh, a disabled toilet. But where it was left, I suppose, was the issue initially. Then we realised that there was no cleaning contract in place uh, and couldn't be got in place because for a number of issues it was advertised too late and then we couldn't get uh, a cleaning contract in place. Uh, it appeared that there was nobody uh, interested in that. Uh, I understand that there will be a cleaning contract put out for procurement for Innisgrown, uh, Mullagmore and Ross's Point public toilets. Uh, and we need to ensure that that cleaning contract is put in place prior uh, to these facilities open. Uh, in the motion, I asked for a date, of what date the toilets at Mullagmore will open. The community deserve to know this. The public deserve to know this. Uh, and we need to be clear with the public in uh, relation to this facility. It's not only for the local community, it's for the tourists and the domestic, as I say, the domestic tourism, which is likely to see huge increases, particularly in these areas over the second half of the summer period this year. We have to have these facilities ready. I understand Town and Village Renewal Funding was allocated by government three years ago for these toilets in Mullagmore. It, it simply isn't good enough what happened last year. Uh, and we need to see the, uh, as I say, the cleaning contract in place. I want to ask the director, for, press the director on this because we can't allow an over and back situation like what happened last year. What is the date that these toilets are likely to open? And can the director guarantee that there will be a cleaning contract in place prior to these facilities uh, opening? Uh, if she can come back in on that, I'd like Councillor Gilroy, uh, who was co-sponsored the motion in first as well. Uh, thanks, and um, it, it's, it's a pleasure to be involved in this motion. I had this in uh, late last year at the municipal district that we would... Sorry, that we would uh, have a decision by March as to exactly what was going to happen. Um, that was six months ago, so it really is imperative that we get an answer now as to what is happening. Um, it's urgently needed. Along with the, the, the unsightliness of the port on the green in Mullockmore, it was the first thing that welcomed you when you went enter the village. People then started leaving bags of rubbish behind it, which was even worse. The wind came and blew them over and they ended up over across the road in front of the convent. Um, 
on the previous motion, if I may go back about the camper vans, it's an issue at Mullockmore as well. And what happens is that they reverse up to the edge of the edge of the path. And a camper van is not like a car. It stretches out for about eight foot behind the back wheels. So it's stretching across the footpaths. So people can't walk along the footpaths. In, in fact, near the where the port were, there was barely room to get between the port and some of the camper vans where they part. So really, we have to make sure that we have our part in place, but the residents down there do not, under any circumstances, want to see a port on the green. Whatever else has to be done, something different has to be done with it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fox. Yeah, just to support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Casserly? Yeah, yes, I also want to support the motion. This has been raised on numerous occasions, um, and I had applied or asked for funding to be allocated. At, the, uh, at that time, the Councillor Walsh stated the funding was allocated, and I, I, I can't understand why the, the money wasn't spent and the works weren't uh, carried out at that time. It's a huge issue, particularly for the volunteers, going back to volunteers again, who um, do Trojan work and keeping Mullock more uh, clean. Uh, it was very upsetting for them when they saw the um, the, the portaloos there, particularly when they had fallen over. Uh, it is the first thing that you see, and uh, Mullock Moore is a signature point on the wide Atlantic Way, and there is no way that it should be left at this stage without a toilet again for this season. It's it's gone on for far too long. We've all had uh, we've all run out of patience on this, so it really, really is important that this be dealt with very soon because more people are staying at home, more people are. Um, will be visiting Mullock Moor over the next few months. So it ha those facilities are a must. And it's not fair on the local businesses that, uh, that, that, that people would go in and use those um, private facilities when there should be a public facility. The public facility is there, but it needs to be um, upgraded and improved. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grady. Cahir, look, I'd like to fully support the motion. This has been an ongoing issue in the Mullockmore area. And exactly as Councillor Gilroy has outlined, people were leaving rubbish behind uh, the port to lose where they were. Um, the existing facility needs to be upgraded, but in opening any facility, it's like opening a park or opening anything, you have to have ongoing uh, maintenance of it and the maintenance of the toilets. It's imperative that when it is opened, and I think it's important that a date is given, that there's a maintenance plan for clear, a plan for cleaning uh, the facility on a daily basis. Thank you, Councillor Queenan. Yeah, I, I just want to support the motion, but I want to put on record uh, my support and my congratulations to Michael Carthy and Rio Grady and Darley Clark's team for the work they have done in the community, in, in the town and village, and the amount of money that has been sourced around the county. And in case any impression be given that uh, on Rio Grady and Michael Carthy, uh, they're doing Trojan work, working on the ground with local communities and getting. Uh, Project's finished. Thank you. Could I, could I support Councillor Queen and I'd like to support the motion as well. Could I support Councillor Queen on, on, on that? I think I don't want to, to leave this council today that, that, that anything um, to do with town and village renewal schemes has been has been done badly or that, that we're not in full support of them because they're a great scheme in every community in this county and, and Rio Grady, uh, certainly in South Sligo, has been a, a, a great uh, man in dealing with these schemes from the council and so I'd like to, uh, to support Councillor Queen and what he's saying there as well. Yeah, thanks and I would concur with uh, the, the sentiments to the recreational work of Michael Carty and Rio Grady and Dorothy's team. Motion number 28, Councillor Haley, can I have a seconder? Right, seconder, Councillor Connolly. Uh, this motion is in relation to a contract that uh, UNPOST has taken out with a uh, lot of their uh, members in the postmaster and postmistress, and I'm looking for a two-year extension. Uh, they're in the middle of a period where their, their financial review is due in the summer, and local branches will be judged and assessed on their income over the past three years, which, of course, with the effect on the lack of footfall caused by COVID-19 restrictions. I spoke to uh, postmistress and postmasters throughout Sligo and they estimate that their income is down Anthem from 25 to 30 percent. So it would be completely unfair and unjust for the post office branches uh, to look to review this at this period of time. 
and they need to take this into account because post offices or networks are hanging off a cliff at the moment. Um, we have an opportunity here as well with the post offices that these could be one-stop shops for community and council services, including paying uh, care tax, fines, rent, semi-state um, uh, state, state exam fees. So the future of the post office is in the hands of county council and the government currently. And in light of the pandemic, post office need an additional two years extension in order to give them a chance to get back on their feet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Connolly. I'd just like to support the motion. Um, it would be very unfair if uh, post offices was judged on their income through the COVID uh, period because uh, this would result in, in a lot of them actually closing and giving up these agencies. And I'd like to compliment Councillor Healy on bringing forward this motion and support it 100%. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McSharry. Uh, thank you, Kirla. I'll be brief. Yeah, I, I, I want to support the motion. One would hope that common sense would prevail here. Um, and uh, again, as been stated several times, the post office, the local post office, is the lifeblood of a local community. Uh, again, ultimately, the community bank uh, uh, model, w I think, would be more appropriate. But I do support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Yes, Gary, I just support the motion as well and look just to say that, that, that the, the, the post office network has been the heartbeat of the communities and there's been too many of them lost um, over the last number of years and look, at, we're, we're, we're hearing of, of news, you know, even, even coming in about, about Bank of Ireland and um, about Bank of Ireland branches throughout our county and um, that we think we're going to lose now as well and so we need to, to, to keep this post office network there and maybe this this is a, a, an opportunity for the post offices um, to be used as a banking network as well. And I think that's very, very important for our towns and villages throughout, throughout our, 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 rural, our rural county. I will support the motion also, Kyra. Thank you. Uh, moving on, motion 29, Councillor Gilroy, second. Can I get a sec, Councillor McSherry? Uh, thanks for the response to, to both um, Dorothy Clark and John Moore and for their responses. This is a, a, it's two pages of a response, so it's quite detailed, and I'd recommend that everybody reads it. Um, Sligo County Council, uh, we're in a funny position that we, we, we don't, we control, but we don't control. We have not control of all the issues involved. Um, there is, uh, you know, we have a key role to play, as the response says, in ensuring that the right conditions are in place to facilitate both private and social housing. COVID-19 has amplified the trend of a shortage, and it's a chronic and worsening shortage. Um, uh, I'm told there's no shortage of land zoned for residential purposes to meet the population target set out in the National Plan and that the upcoming review of the Sligo and Environments uh, Local Area Plan will provide even more. Um, we need dwellings urgently. Um, the lack of new dwellings is going to cause A, house prices to escalate, B, a shortage of rental properties, C, an increase in the price of rental properties, and D, cause industries that may come to Sligo to choose elsewhere if they don't have a place for their staff to live, their prospective staff. Um, it was reported to me that in 2017, our former chief executive told a meeting that from start of planning to work commencing on site for local authority housing could take up to six years. Um, you know, that it is a slow, arduous process, and I accept that. In the private sector, I'm told that it takes about three years. So if we start waiting for the new county development plan and the new Sligo and environs plan, we're going to be looking at 2027 to 2030 for providing these houses. Um, Dorothy said in her thing that there's about 200 houses on site and at, in Sligo at the moment, and, and I'm aware of all of those, and it is important that they're common. But Frank's... Um, our Sligo County Council's uh, submission to the National Development Plan re Renewal, or the, the, I can't think of the name for it now, but it said that there was 118 houses completed in Sligo in 2020. 468 houses is our target. That means we're 350 houses in arrears from last year. We're going to be even more in arrears after this year. And really, thinking about it in 2023 is not good enough. We need to be coming up with a plan now. I received a letter from a developer last week who's ready to go on a site that's in, the, um, in one of the, the reserve areas. 
and he has written out that he's ready to go and wants to move. And he is actually, I believe, he, he, he told me he has written to all councillors, but I don't know whether that's accurate or not, whether everyone has received it. But we need to be coming up with a system and we need to be told what can we as councillors do and what can we help the executive to do to change this? Because the, the line we're taking at the moment, the land that's owned for housing, the people that own the land don't want to build houses. Some of them want to farm it. It's not that they're hoarding it or anything like that. They're using it for other purposes. And if they don't want to build on it, that's fine. So we need to we need to go through all the land that is owned and find a way of of um, of encouraging the people to to develop it. And finally, on the regard of basically what we've been asked in the in the email that we received was to uh, introduce a, a contravention of the plan. Now, what is the process we need to do that? Because we need to supply housing to the to the county we urgently 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 need this and the, the responses as good as they are and as detailed don't give me details of how we're going to catch up by the end of next year because we need to be caught up there are businesses that want to come to sligo and they're going to turn their back because we do not have the houses so thank you very much Thank you, Councillor McSharry. I'll get to the members' room as well. Then, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Gahir. Look, yeah, I, I support every every word uh, Councillor Gilroy has said. Unfortunately, and it is very unfortunate, there's a serious lack of private or affordable uh, housing schemes in Sligo Town and County at the moment. And while there was a little bit of movement in uh, social housing, it's it's only a, it's a it's a drop in the ocean. And I think uh, you know if there's one thing that we could learn from this pandemic, as bad and all as it is, there is opportunities for uh, counties like Sligo because there's people in bigger urban centres that now realise they can work remotely from home, and they're looking at places like Sligo, uh, town and county to relocate. But also, if you look at all the elderly people in different communities that have raised their families, they can't downsize. You have young families uh, that are squeezed into smaller houses that want to upscale. And then there's the young couple that want to get on the property ladder. Um, there's no housing for them. And the, a lot of them feel they're going to be renters for life. Uh, and, and again, that's a very uh, unfortunate uh, narrative. And as a local authority, we have land, we're a planning authority, we're an enforcement authority. And Councillor Gilroy is right, there, there is a lot of builders, uh, indigenous builders from Sligo, that are prepared to take the risk if there was a tendering process with the local authority or something in place to let them into the market, let them build, to create employment, to generate a lot of money for the local economy. And because they're local, the council know what they can do. They, they have uh, a lot of them uh, very good stable track records in terms of delivery, a very good product at a reasonable price, and that's what's needed. So we do need a plan, and a lot of people have been arguing for that plan uh, uh, for a long time. Okay, the, the, there was a recession and now there's the pandemic, uh, and certain things have changed, but we do need a plan because there's a lot of people looking to the councillors and uh, politicians for solutions or, or some uh, indication especially, and I have to say, for the young people that are out there that feel they never get on the property ladder, and those people that love Sligo, want to live in Sligo, so many people outside Sligo that would relocate in the morning if the opportunity was there. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Uh, yes, Claire, look, th thank you. Uh, look, I'd like to support the motion as well, and, and look, I've been in contact with the Minister's office over these issues. Um, we, we, there isn't a house to rent in an awful lot of our towns and villages around this county and probably them all and um, and obviously there's not too many houses to buy as well so this this is a serious issue that we are facing over the next number of years and um, and we are also there's also the problem with our development plan and housing densities now this is the national development plan as well when you're looking to um uh apply planning applications in some of our towns and villages you know, it, it's not the same in our towns and villages here as it is in, in, in the bigger towns and cities around this country so the densities shouldn't apply per hectare to our towns and villages and i think this is something that's very very serious at the moment i think that there is a, there is um we would have the ability to sell service sites and um, maybe bigger sites in a lot of our towns and villages right now and at the moment because of the housing densities we can't do that so that's a very, very serious issue, and I've been on to the Minister's Office about that 
issue. And I think there are developers out there that are willing to take the chance and take the risk. Um, and I don't think it is a risk right now, but certainly uh, this is a big issue. And I think that there needs to be a, a serious uh, plan moving forward on this issue. Councillor Clark, I think, wants to come in as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here, look, um, I want to support uh, every word that uh, both Councillor uh, Gilroy and Councillor McCharry has said, and indeed Councillor Taylor, and I'm not going to repeat those. But the impression out there with developers or, or builders, not developers, builders that want to build houses and create employment and provide the houses that's required, is that the council is a closed shop. Councillors are haven't got the power of the say to influence planning and the planning department uh, seems to be a closed shop. So I would propose that uh, we, with the view that the county development plan is approaching the review, that councillors would meet, a special meeting would be held and may be held on a monthly basis to discuss issues with Doherty and the plan, all the planners in that section and see can we come around with a, a plan that would deliver in the best interest of all the people of, of County Slide and provide housing that's badly needed. Councillor Queen. I want to support the motion. I have a motion similar later on. I won't get it today, obviously, now. And look at we get, we, there is a serious housing crisis in the county. I'm concerned about my area, West Ligo. There's no house to rent in West Ligo, and there are at least 10 to 20 families in our area who are desperate need even to rent and they can't. And uh, them people are not sleeping at night, uh, worried, uh, and the, like our hands are tied. And we need uh, sentences from government. And the first big uh, problem that happened was when our housing budget was taken from us. This nonsense about applying to Dublin up and down the road with, with applications to Dublin. When we had a housing budget, we could plan our own and build our own, uh, but of course that was taken away. And, and, and I thought Fianna Fáil was going to bring really store that, but I was so fair, they haven't. But anyway, I support the motion. Thank you. Agreed, members. Motion number 30, Councillor Haley. Can I get a seconder? Seconder for motion 30. Uh, Councillor Clare, is it? Uh, this motion was asked to be put on by uh, the beef plant movement, uh, as was the the signal to all the councillors and TDs in the area in relation to the current operation of the beef industry is unfair for, to the farmers on the grounds that is uh, contributing to a lot of farmers drifting away and especially young farmers across the country. Over the past month I have spoken to a number of beef far farmers in Sligo and there is a common concern that the way the beef factories are operating, farmers can't financially plan the future investment due to the lack of co uh, confirmed prices from cattle from the meat factory and also the lack of weighing facilities. The farmer, as we all know, has to pay for his feed, his silage, his insurance, vet fees and maintenance. All this is set in stone. But when a farmer is selling them to the fa factory, they have, no, they have no idea what price they are going to, to receive. At this stage, many of fa young farmers are finding it more difficult to stay in farming. This issue has, uh, these issues and more have been raised previously and negotiated through the beef, uh, the beef Task Force set up by the Minister of Agriculture, Charlie McConaughey. However, many of the agreements have been... Uh, um, can I agree with you? Yeah, the tax plans are so independent. Reneged, reneged upon by the factories. It is now evidence that the task force is not efficient, uh, sufficient in solving these issues. The government have acknowledged this by agreeing to provide an ombudsman for the sector. This is not strong enough and not effective. The future of farming in Ireland is in the hands of the government. We we have to ensure that an independent regulator with powers is put in place so that young farmers and their families can see a future in rural Ireland. Thank you. The members room, there was a second, there was a Councillor Clerk. Yes, Councillor yes. Clerk. Chairman, I, I'm delighted to, to second the motion of Councillor Higgies and uh, it's a very effective motion and I congratulate him for bringing it forward. The, fa the fact of the matter is, as we speak today, Beef prices in the Northern Ireland is 60 cents a kilo more than it is in the Southern Republic. And I had a motion at last month's meeting for the Minister to engage with a, an all Ireland food policy. And I see there's no reply to that motion. But I commend Councillor Healy and support the motion fully. Thank you. Councillor Milano. Can I, can I, support, 
Can I support the motion as well? Um, okay. Here. Thanks. And Councillor Quinlan as well. Councillor. Yeah, we'll Thank you, boys. I want to compliment Councillor Healy for his motion. And um, I, I totally agree with the need for an independent meat regulator. Every time there's any sort of an oversupply, the price of beef goes through the floor. And meat factories is all about making money. Farmers are losing money now since 1996 that produce beef. And the, this situation will not continue and needs to be taken into hand. Uh, Councillor Boyler Bray, had you indicated to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. A big business dominates the agricultural sector in the meat processing, for example, three companies, ABP, Don Meats, Keypack, they dominate the industry. The big processors always use quality assurance programs to stifle the competition. This means the ordinary farmer gets roughly 15 to 20 percent less than their, than their counterparts in Britain. We need to rebalance the sector in favour of small to medium-sized ventures. To do this, we need to impose a levy on the profits of major processors and major supermarkets. This should bring in money annually. In order to gather this levy, the processors will have to make their full financial accounts publicly available, even if they have become unlimited firms. Supermarkets should also be legally obliged to declare profits made in Ireland and produce full accounts. Um, we need, like, these processes are only motivated, motivated by profit rather than the nutritional value of the food. And we need an orderly uh, thing that they're free, uh, fair processing and fair prices can be guaranteed for the producers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maguire. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cahirlach. Um, I'd, I'd like you to commend uh, Councillor Healy on this motion. Um, I think it's a great idea. It's remarkable, actually, that the meat industry has lasted so long uh, without having a regular in place. And I think that speaks to the um, political influence that um, the meat sectors have. Um, so I'm wholeheartedly behind this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed. Motion 31, Councillor Cassidy. I just want to thank, thank the members for that and also say that it will be a help as well uh, with an independent regulator, not alone for the farmers, but also for us, the consumers. So it has an overall effect. I'd ask also that this motion will be sent around to all local authorities, the exact same as motion number 28 regarding unpost. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hayley. Uh, seconder for motion 31, Councillor Cassidy, Councillor Walsh. Um, thank you. I'd also like to be associated with the previous motion. Um, yes, I'd, I'll keep this brief. I'd like to welcome the report um, the design works associated with phase three um, and the environmental evaluation will commence in the coming months. The residents in the area are keen that the work start as soon as possible and those residents living off that road like are having to deal with the extremely dangerous uh, junction daily and they're asked for a progress report since the preferred option route was selected back in 2019 and as everyone knows it's one of the busiest roads in the county so uh, I welcome the report but residents there are very keen to have the work start. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Walsh. Yeah just to uh, support the motion um, I suppose this is on the cards for a long long time now and it's important we see progression on it. Uh, thank you. Members room Councillor Clerk. Councillor Clerk. Now, you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Sorry, Chair. Uh, I want to support the motion. This is a motion of national importance. It's a, very, a vital road. Uh, I want to commend your own work, uh, look in relation to the meetings that you and myself had in relation to this uh, great upgrading of the road and the people that were met there locally from the Screen to Merd and Beltre and Colani areas. Uh, and, and, and your own input has brought this uh, road to the stage it's at, and I, I want to commend you and, and thank you for your support in it. Thank you. Th thanks, Councillor Clark, and yourself. I know Councillor Clark had huge input into the progression of getting that moved on. Motion number 32, Councillor Gibbons, second Councillor. Hmm? You okay, we started five. We'll just take it. We took us to, yeah, we, start, we started at five past. So, Councillor Cassidy, you do indicate it? Yeah. Councillor Cassidy, second. Yeah, I'd like to second the motion, please. Yeah. Huh? Um, she had her hand up. Actually, well, she had her hand up. I saw a yellow hand up. The Lady Aaron statue was erected on the site of the old Mark Cross. The statue uh, designed by uh, Herbert G. Burns in is 16 foot high and made of Sicilian marble. The statue uh, 
that this pellicus, Ireland, her hand is raised high in an act of defiant rebellion. She wears a, a pyraging cap, which is the symbol of liberty, right? And the broken chain that lies beneath her feet symbolizes the destruction uh, of the bondage with England. Lady Airden is a landmark in Sligo town. Uh, it was unveiled in front of a crowd of around 7,000 people in September 1998 to commemorate uh, the centenary of the 1798 uh, resurrection and all the Irish men who fought and died for the Irish dream of Irish freedom. The location is, is significant in that it marks the centre of a one mile circle of local governance that was um, the official responsibility of the mayor and the corporation of Sligo until Fine Gael and the Labour Party abolished all boroughs and town councils in 2014, the plurable act against the urban communities of the state. Our history should never be forgotten and the monuments that were erected to honour these events on Irish history should, uh, should be maintained to a fitting standard. And the reason that I brought up this monument, I know myself over, over a number of years that work has been carried out on this, but it needs a total refurbishment. And what I would ask in relation to it, after we do get the specialists in to do this, because it's always specialists that carried out this work, I would nearly approach then after that is maybe Sligo Tidy Towns or some other organisation just to do a yearly clean up on it. And that it save us all that problem that we have every so many years, getting up scaffolding, the cleaning, the work that goes on, it takes the guts of a week for it to carry out. But in saying the Thielen Monument, at least it comes in under this borough um, council. Mm -hmm. But there's other monuments that's out there that mark great events that don't come in under any local authority. They come in under the likes of national graves and the national monuments, and nobody can go near them. And I think it's a disgrace because even to try and get through to these organisations to clean them up. I mean to say Lady Aaron's sister monument is the Thiele Monument above the Palace of Air. That was unveiled at the same time in 1898, was the commemorate the 1798 rising. Yet it has been let fall into decay and nobody is responsible for it. It's until it's practically overgrown completely instead of it being kept there. It's a tourist attraction, the same as the Lady Erdin one that's there in Sligo. And what I would like in relation to the Lady Erdin is that a program of work will be carried out in relation to it maybe every couple of years just to maintain it. It is a part of Sligo. It's a feature point at Sligo Town. It's a beautiful looking statue. And I think myself that it really needs the care and attention. And we just don't want anybody out there thinking that we forgot our history. The brave men that fought in the 1798 rebellion. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, yes, actually, when I saw this on the agenda, um, I was delighted to to see that and to I'm delighted to welcome the report because uh, the works um, are going to be carried out in time for the 125th anniversary. Actually, last November, I asked for these conservation works to be carried out because after the successful conservation works and renovation of the Metal Man, and I'd like to commend everybody who was involved in a really, really successful project that got national attention. Last November, I requested for those restoration works to be carried out on the beautiful Lady Erin monument because I suppose people were, were uh, very interested and they were very taken by the story of the metal man and that they some of them were more aware I suppose of other statues that were around and other monuments so it, it came to my attention and it was brought to my attention that Lady Erin needed some uh, TLC so I'm delighted um, and I'd like to just thank Siobhan Ryan and everybody in, in the department for I suppose from last November it's only 14 or 15 weeks that they you know that they have found the money for this and that there there is a plan in place so i'm looking forward to uh, to seeing her done up and looking well for the 125th anniversary thank you thank you councillor haley yeah. welcome i welcome this news that the work is going to be done on it because it is a vocal place and a uh, tourist used to start, start their journey around the town from there uh which uh, i think he was uh, ryan the Ryan lad used to do a tour around Sligo and it was an awful thing that they started there and see the state of the monument the way it is. But I'd also ask the council might look at it as well, so also at another monument there at Oat Bret Bretany's, uh, uh, um there's a monument there that needs cleaning up as well. 
In relation to the Teelia Monument, the Teelia Monument, there is a group of us there. We have been in, in correspondence with National Grave Authorities. In fairness to them, they have come up with a plan of what we're going to do with, unfortunately, with COVID and everything else. But uh, we did work there earlier on and tidied it up. And uh, a bit of history for people is that the hand was shot off it. We have found the hand, and the hand now is in... in uh, it was found in Colony. A woman had was given it when it was shot down at the time, and they wrapped it up in an old cloth, and it was stuck up an old chimney. And uh, that's that. We found the hand, so the hand is there, and we're hoping to put it back in place. But uh, the National Grave Authority have given a commitment to do works on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maguire. Um, thank you, Mr. Hirlock. Um, I too would like to support the motion. Um, and actually, there are uh, tours, online tours, that still include Lady of the Urn Monument. Um, uh, and I completely concur with the remarks made already. Just uh, on a similar note, um, there was a motion brought before the Borough Council a number of years ago in relation to identifying other potential sites uh, for statues or monuments to be erected. Um, and we've never had a report from that committee or even confirmation that that committee was established. Um, I do think they really enhance our urban space. Um, and I would love um, to know whether that committee was established or whether any sites for new monuments um, have been identified. I'm aware of at least one funder who um, would be willing to pay for uh, a piece of sculpture to be erected uh, in the centre of town but obviously that's completely stalled depending on the outcome of a committee being established and a site being identified. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Grady. Just briefly, I would like to support uh, Councillor Gibbons' motion. Uh, he has given a clear outline of the history and the importance of, of the monument. A couple of years ago, there was a fence or a, a, around that statue, and um, it was removed a couple of years ago when there was uh, upgrading work uh, done on it. And I often wonder, was it the right decision at the time? But I do think going forward, uh, we have to maintain it and see that that it's properly looked after. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Motion 33, Councillor Bree. Second, Councillor Mullaney. Well, look, in, in the 17th century, Cunamallan became famous as the home of the brothers Thomas and Lawrence Cunella and were considered the greatest Irish composers and performers of the heart, with the exception of O'Carolan. Uh, with the long away from the segments of the M4 road, uh, this council, having received representations from both the school through year and agreed to honour the memory of the community brothers by using grant aid from the percent of art scheme to locate a specific piece of art adjacent to the M4 in Cunamallan. In this context, I am anxious that the Council's percent for Art Steering Committee be established so as the project can be advanced. And I know the response to my motion from the Director of Services, and I presume that there shouldn't be any difficulty in identifying a suitable site of the man for whatever artistic piece the Council will eventually commission. And I formally move the motion to Herlock. Thanks, Councillor Milani. Yeah, hi, look, I just want to support the motion. I had a, a motion down asking for this monument to be erected last May, and I just want to see progress on it. Thanks, Thanks. Councillor Walsh. Yeah, Kerr, look, I too want to support the motion. I've been in contact with the director in the last number of weeks in relation to this, uh, and I understand she has made contact with uh, the chair, Martin Enright, on a proposed location at the site of Castle Ball on the issue. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Fox. Yeah, just to support the motion. Yeah. And I'd like to support the motion as well, because I know Martin Enright contacted a, a few of his councillors. Motion 34, Councillor. I just thank, thank the members for the support. Could we possibly have some idea, possibly in the next month or two, how the discussions are going to go with us? Yes, Councillor Bray, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Councillor Clayton, if you're a seconder, 34. Can you hear that? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can I hear what? Can I get clarity? It's 10 past 12. Are we going to continue? What's the story? No, we didn't. We just start, we started, it was almost 10 past 12 in my watch. I'm going to take this one. Do you want to take it or we leave it? Uh, we'll, it does, no, I'm, I'm going to leave with three motions for the next week. Right, okay. Now, regarding the motions, um, Chim, sorry, uh, Councillor Maguire. Thank you, Kihirlov. Sorry, I was just trying to come in to support uh, Councillor Bree's motion there. Um, I think it's well made and given the huge amount of uh, road funding uh, had over the last number of years, I think it's a great opportunity for us to get some um, sculpture put in. And uh, this motion in relation to Clune Mahan and the Knellan brothers, um, I think supported by all councillors. Thank you. 
Thank you. Now we have, um, we're going to leave it at that. So with your agreement, it's up to the members. Do we adjourn until this day week or do you want to add these motions onto the agenda? I propose, I propose we adjourn until next Monday. Next Monday, or do you want to add them on to the April meeting? I propose oh, we add them on to the April meeting. I saw them. Yeah. April, I propose. Should we be here? Yeah, look, I propose five o'clock next Monday. No, five o'clock? Yeah. I second that. Hang on now, I have one proposal. Oh, yeah. I will go four o'clock. Five o'clock, but will the, the, the members of staff be here? Four four. We're going four o'clock. Four o'clock, so. Four o'clock. Have we, have we agreed on four o'clock next Monday? Martin Baker. Martin. You're Baker. You're on mute, Martin. Get the music. You're on mute. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Baker, your there. microphone is none. Hey, Turn on your microphone, Councillor Baker. <laughs> Uh, no. no. Councillor Milani, why please get... No. Uh, here, look, can, can I just compliment you on doing external work during this pandemic, both in the organising of the meetings and in the conducting of the business? The reason we haven't got two today is there's too many motions on the floor. And I think it's time that we looked at coming back to one motion per member, the same as if you're sitting on Leitrim County Council, and that you bring the remainder of the motions to uh, a municipal meeting and I agree with my colleagues in the members room I think this could be done in a fair more efficient way well, look, uh, to, yeah. Yeah, and I uh, agree uh, with what uh, Councillor uh, Milani has just said I try at the as chair of the meeting to let people speak, I don't want to put a time limit on people, I know some people are annoyed some people talk I, okay, if you want a time limit, I'll set a time limit, but I've tried to let people in. The way I've done it from day one with the, since the COVID has been, it's with year cooperation. Meetings finish if everyone cooperates. If people don't all pull together, we end up with half the agenda covered and, not, and we're coming back then to another day. So I'm leaving it to people's discretion. If you can hold motions forward for municipal district meetings, put them into it. Do some members don't put in motions at all because they wait? Do some members don't put in motions at all, uh, any motions? So, look, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We've one hour 55. A lot of, I'm not going to say whether a motion is, is credible or non-credible. Everybody has to decide that themselves. Now, we have to make a decision on the half the agenda that's here, the, the remainder. Do we go for next Monday, 10 a.m.? or 4 p.m. Or, 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 or we have three options, or do we bring them forward to the April no, no, meeting? No, no, Chair. Chair. Yeah? I propose next Monday, whether it's at 10 a.m. or 4 p.m., choose at a time. We can't be right. dragging it out. Right. Push forward. right, next Monday, so does that suit? 10 a.m., 4 p.m.? 4, 4, 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Okay, 4 p.m. Well, if we do it 4 p.m., are we going to have them finished in an hour? Yes, yes. 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 Right, well, I'm holding you all to that. Is that I won't be long. I won't be talking like some of them. <laughs> right. Good. Can we take these um, votes of sympathies as agreed and correspondence? Yeah. Councillor Baker, do you want Baker wants to get Councillor in. Baker. Uh, wants Sorry, Councillor Baker, yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm away next Monday, so it's just quick. I haven't talked at all today. So all I want to say is our funding for the disabilities and that came down, which I'll be very close to. And I'd like to compliment you all. I appeal that we try and get all our money spent. And in fairness, they got it overspent. And that's why we have got the same again this year. And it just shows you when everyone works hard enough together and keeps getting pushed that we get through. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Compliment all the staff. And especially the builders, Michael Gucky in particular, for their huge work. Builders last out five months and they really dug deep to get the we spent our money. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. I wouldn't agree with that. Councillor Milani, Councillor Walsh. Yeah, I agree with that. Just one quick point. I understand there's a lot of staff changes within uh, different departments within the local authority. I would ask that a memo be sent out to all the members outlining those staff changes and the dates that they'll come into effect. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So we're agreed next Monday, 4 p.m. here, and we'll do it done and dusted at 5. Yeah. Okay, thanks, members. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Wow.